Good morning, good morning, and happy Thursday from the farm. Welcome to another episode of Thinking Outside the Soil with your host, Shani Alfalfa Seed, where I get to talk story about topics related to the farmers and ranchers using hydroponic practices to grow the crops and creatures we need to eat. Thank you for being with us on this beautiful morning. The sun is shining and the weather is sure sweet after yesterday's snow, though it's melted a little bit and now it's a bit heavy. So I've assigned uh, one of the kiddos to go shovel today. So we'll see how much he likes that. Um, Nobody likes to shovel, especially when it's cold, but it's sunny and there's chirping chickens out there. So he's got some entertainment. I also, uh, we have a little portable Bluetooth speaker that I encourage him to take around and I tell him to go out there and jam with the chickens so that they can hear some music and we can give them a little bit of love. We um, are coming out of mole and we're getting more eggs. It's really great. I know that what we feed is partly uh, responsible for that. It's also because it's just that's the time of year. I wanted to talk about hydroponic clover a bit more today so we could wrap up a little bit of some questions that I've had about hydroponic clover. But real quick, before I talk more about that, if you like what you've heard so far or want to hear anything else, please leave me a comment, send me an email, Sean at Thinking Outside the Soil. Follow the show and leave a review so others know why they should follow too. The first crop that we started growing hydroponically for sprouts was alfalfa and clover, so the first plants rather. And I saw that a lot of people were mixing uh, clover and alfalfa and selling it on sandwiches and other things like that. So that was one of the first reasons why we got into selling sprouts. We started selling them to smaller markets for human consumption. And there's a lot of competition in that market here in Northern Colorado. Microgreens and sprouts have become very popular. One of the challenges that we've seen with sprouts, and those of you out there may have seen the same thing, is that they're treated slightly differently from a food safety perspective. So sprouts are not considered a traditional farm product. They're actually considered a processed product. And in order to sell sprouts to humans, we have to have a a food safe, a commercial safe food safety kitchen. Now I say that in comparison to those out there like us and others who do microgreens. What are microgreens? Microgreens are essentially baby plants that we grow out for one to three weeks. The plants grow a few inches. They get their first set of leaves and then one to two set of true leaves. And we cut them down and give them uh, how we give them. We sell them to people. We give them to our animals, depending on what we do. So one of the things that we learned through that process of selling microgreens and sprouts is that they are looked at differently from the regulation perspective. And the reason we started to walk down the animal feed path was because of some of those initial challenges as a startup farm trying to invest the capital resources to have a commercial kitchen and or find a commercial kitchen that we could rent to do some of our processing. Some of our deciding factors for growing animal feed were what does that look like for us at this time and how viable is it going to be both economically and for what we're trying to do with what we've got here.
Many of our customers loved the microgreens and the microgreen clover that we would grow from time to time. So the first question that I have from people out there is, are you growing clover and are you doing it in microgreens? And so currently right now we are not doing clover and we have shifted away from doing microgreens for our own operation for a couple of reasons. One, we have found that there is a lot of competition in the microgreen market. And it's pretty funny if you get online, you can find dozens and dozens of business plans of how to start your own microgreen business and quote unquote, make lots of money. And that's fantastic. And it's led to a lot of competition. So something that we see here is our location makes a big influence into how well we can sell microgreens. Our market here is less, less inclined to buy microgreens. We have a lot of farmers and ranchers here that feed those types of crops out to their animals. So it was quite funny early on, we were selling a lot of the same things to people who would have normally fed them to their animals. Now of note is that we would purchase extremely clean seed, only organic, and do only organic processes as we sell our food for people which has allowed us to adhere a higher level of food safety when we're approaching it from an animal perspective. The second thing about microgreens is that they actually take up a lot more space than sprouts do. So something of note is that most microgreens are grown like grass in a tray of some kind. On a smaller scale, we use those 10 inch by 20 inch black trays. And on larger scales, companies use what look like bunk beds or big racks that you would see at hardware stores and warehouse stores full of levels of grass. And so there is that space required for the plant to grow from seed into its leafy stage so that space required to grow the green matter is actually better optimized when doing a sprouting process and we have seen with what we're doing that we are able to get three to five times more yield in the same space because we're able to put our production model more stacked. Sprouts are also shown to be just as nutritious as microgreens. And when thinking about that, I tend to look at the stage of plant and trying to figure out its optimal nutrition at what stage of life. So I brought up that we were going to touch a little bit more about clover, and it's some researchers in Egypt that had some of the most encouraging results with growing sprouts versus microgreens. So researchers there studied clover sprouts and they looked at growing those clover sprouts over different periods of times and they found promising results when they were growing clover sprouts at out to three to four days and the researchers saw that they were able to get about a four time increase in yield from seed to sprout in that short amount of time While looking at that, those same researchers studied the nutritional profiles of those plants at those various stages. And what they found was that the nutritional profiles of those plants 
were slightly better at that young stage and at about the three to five day stage of plants we see that they're at about their peak level when we're thinking about them from that microgreen and sprout perspective when we talk about that we say that microgreens and sprouts are more nutritious than their adult forage counterparts so when we're saying that sprouts are slightly more nutritious than microgreens we are using this information from Egypt to make that type of rationale. Now another neat thing about clover is that those researchers took that clover and they were able to dry it out and only found a 25% loss in the dry matter after that three day stage. So sprouts do have a lot of water and so that's very, very encouraging that they only lost 25% in dry matter. Now in contrast, we heard episodes about Jordanian researchers and looking at alfalfa. Now, during some of their research, they also took some of those microgreens, or what we try to say micro fodder, when we're talking about what we use for livestock. They dried that alfalfa micro fodder, and they found a, they found a higher loss in dry matter than they did with clover. So it's one of the encouraging things and things of note that I have seen through my study of clover and the comparison to it the comparison of it to the other ABCDs of hydroponic fodder. And with that, that's about all I have today for you with my thoughts on hydroponic clover. And that's all I have for you today on hydroponic clover a little bit off the cusp with my thoughts today however i would like to say thank you for being with us here on another beautiful morning if you liked what you heard or have heard in the past be sure to follow the show check out the links below there's some really neat things we've got going on Tonight we are doing a live webinar to talk about our Blooming Health blended sprouting mix. This mix has been shown to get a lot better eggs and keep our flock super healthy. They've come out of molt very quickly and our eggs are still looking great. Our feed costs are still pretty low right now. So we are excited to start selling seed to others so that they can be the best chicken farmer that they can be. To learn more about how hydroponic fodder helps farmers save water, improve livestock quality, and become better stewards, check out the links below and thinkingoutsidethesoil.com. Head over there to get yourself a copy of my book, all I need is your address, and when you take care of the shipping costs, I will rush you a copy within a week. There's a special gift to you as my listener, so check out the sprouting video at thinkingoutsidethesoil.com forward slash sprouting. And again, be sure to follow the show, get the book, watch that video, so you don't miss out on becoming part of the next agricultural revolution. Thank you again for being here on another episode. Take care and have a lovely day. Hey, before you go, check out the links below. Leave me a rating and review and follow the show. Don't forget to get yourself some of our Blooming Health blended sprouting mix. Our mix has been shown to get the best eggs and create the healthiest flocks. With feed costs going up, 
Right now's the time to lock in a subscription so that you can get the best eggs without having to go to the grocery store or the feed store anymore. Check out the links below to get yourself some Blooming Health Blended Sprouting Mix.